around the world. We're truly honored to have you with us uh, this evening. Also, uh, we're very honored to have uh, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, uh, the Chair uh, Farooq Katwari, who is the CEO of Eden Allen, and uh, other co-chair is Stanley Bergman. Um, he couldn't be with us, he sent us his regrets, but he also sends his best wishes to all of us. And also we are very honored to have uh, Bob Silverman, who is the Executive Director of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, uh, someone who has served the State Department for over 27 years. On a lighter note, Dr. Saeed taught me this, Bob, uh, the Arabic uh, uh, word Bab means door. So Bob over here is Bab of peace, Bab of salam. So we welcome him. Uh, thank you so much. And my, my dear colleague at the chaplain's table reminded me that the chaplains that are out here are representative of not just the military, but also their chaplaincy across other institutions across the country, including hospitals and universities and other locations. So we, we thank you once again for your presence. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a tight program, so bear with me. We are going to go ahead and begin. It's 6.15, and I have already, just for the benefit of everybody here, apologized to the speakers in advance for running a tight ship, hopefully. So if any of my actions appear a little bit rude, all of you can be assured I have tendered my apologies in advance. Uh, and now that we move on to a part of the program that should be quite informative. The gentleman that I'm going to be inviting to the stage, Dr. John Andrew Morrow, he's a Quebecois, born in Montreal, and a North American native by ancestry, culture, history, language, and identity, as he puts it. And as he also puts it in writing, he says Dr. Morrow is an Aboriginal inhabitant of the Americas, according to Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, and is recognized as an Indian by the Federal Court of Canada. After completing his uh, honors, uh, the bachelor's, master's, and PhD at the University of Toronto, where he acquired expertise in Hispanic, Native, and Islamic studies, he pursued postgraduate studies in Arabic in Morocco and the United States. Dr. Morrow has also completed the full cycle of traditional Islamic seminary studies and holds the official titles of Mustad, Doctor, Hakim, and Shaykh. Dr. Morrow is the director of the Covenants Foundation, an organization dedicated to disseminating traditional civilizational Islam, promoting Islamic unity, protecting persecuted Christians, and improving relations between Muslims and members of other faiths. His work on the prophetic covenants is fascinating, and I find it indispensable in my own interfaith pursuits. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. John Andrew Morrow. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Salawatu wa salam ala nabi al-kareem Muhammad al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Wa qul ja'a al-haqqu wa zahaqa al-batilu inna al-batila kama zahuqa And say, truth hath come and falsehood hath perished away Lo, falsehood is ever found to vanish I begin with words and thanks of gratitude to Almighty Allah, glorified and exalted be He, to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon Him, to Sidi Karim Irfan, to President Azhar Aziz, to Dr. Muhammad As Sanusi, uh, to Catherine Osborne, to Sidi Farooq uh, Kathwari, uh, to all of the bishops, uh, to Imam Anwar, to Bishop Eden, and to Dr. Syed Saeed, and to all our friends and supporters for the amazing work that they have done and continue to do in the path of humanity and the divinity. Congratulations to you all for your accomplishments. A round of applause, please. Thank you. 
I've been invited to comment upon the Covenant Initiative, an international movement of Muslims committed to spreading the letters, treaties, and covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his faith. Uh, the covenants of the Prophet are found in Jewish, Samaritan, Christian, Zoroastrian, and Muslim sources. They are found in books of Hadith, books of Quranic commentary, books of Islamic jurisprudence, and books of history. They also survive in ancient manuscripts that were passed down over the past 1400 years. They are like gold nuggets in a sandy river. They are like diamonds among stones. The first scholar to compile the letters, treaties, and covenants of the Prophet into a single source was Muhammad Hamidullah in Majmua al wathaiq al Siyasiya fil Ahad al Nabawi. The second scholar to study these documents in detail was Ahmadi Miyanji in his Makatib al Rasul. These works were published in the middle of the 20th century. They were familiar to some scholars and specialists. However, most were unfamiliar with them, and virtually no lay Muslim has had heard of them. It was only with the publication of the Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christian world in 2013 that knowledge of the letters, treaties, and covenants of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, truly became widespread throughout the world. Thanks to the Covenants Initiative and all its partners, the foremost of which is ISNA, the Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the people of the book came out of scholarly obscurity and have now become a powerful global force with serious socio-political and spiritual consequences. The covenants are now available in English, Spanish, Italian, and Arabic, as well as a dozen other major world languages. We are spearheading a dozen different initiatives to disseminate them. Since its publication, this book, and the movement it sparked, has been the subject of over 600 articles in just three years including one in Forbes magazine in May of this year, as well as numerous video, radio, and television speeches and interviews. The Covenants Initiative has been signed by prominent Muslim scholars and leaders from many parts of the world, including influential figures from Al-Azhar University. The Covenants of the Prophet with the Christians of the world has been featured on the website of Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader of Iran, and garnered support from Francis, Pope of Rome, Bartholomew, the Eastern Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch, Theophilos III, Patriarch of Jerusalem, the Holy Fathers from Mount Sinai and Simonopetras in Greece, along with many other religious leaders, both Muslim and Christian. The covenants of the Prophet Muhammad were invoked in the House of Lords, in London in the summer of 2014. In autumn of 2015, the Covenants Initiative sponsored a, peti a petition, the Genocide Initiative, to have the actions of ISIS declared genocide and war crimes, which, as confirmed by an article in Stars and Stripes, was one of the factors leading to the unanimous passage by the House of Representatives of the Fortenberry Resolution and the subsequent statement to the same effect by Secretary of State John Kerry. The Covenants of the Prophet, which includes the Covenant of Medina, were factors that contributed to the Marrakesh Declaration in January of 2016, reaffirming the traditional rights of religious minorities in the Muslim land. They are being used by Muslim and non-Muslim groups across planet Earth for interfaith work and counter-radicalization. In April of 2016, I was honored to receive an Interfaith Leadership Award from the Islamic Society of North America and was part of a delegation of Muslim leaders who met with senior, administration, senior administrators in the Obama White House. The Covenants Initiative has advised the organization for Islamic cooperation, 
The Covenant's initiative has advised religious and political leaders from dozens of different countries. The Covenant's initiative has advised the Obama administration and admonished the Trump administration. <laughs> Yes, you heard me. <laughs> Admonished the Trump administration. We are doing our very best to share the concerns of the Muslim community with the current President of the United States. As Almighty Allah says in the Holy Quran, indeed, we have sent you, O Muhammad, with the truth as a bringer of good tidings and a warner and you will not be asked about the companions of hellfire. <coughs> Our duty is to warn. We are obliged to engage. We must speak truth to power, come what may. To sum it up, since its inception, the movement begun by the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world has become an international phenomenon in the Muslim world. There is no better sign of its global influence than the fact that, after the recent Takfiri attack on the Catholic Cathedral in the Philippines, the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad were immediately cited by no fewer than seven news outlets on the island of Mindanao as proof that the attack was un-Islamic. Alhamdulillah, the covenants of the Prophet have become common knowledge. Let us honor them, for as Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the glorious Quran, and those who break the covenant of Allah after ratifying it, and sever that which Allah hath commanded should be joined, and make mischief in the earth, theirs is the curse, and theirs the ill abode. I send you the greetings of peace from a man of peace, a religion of peace, and a people of peace, and social justice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, since Dr. Morrow was kind enough to leave a minute of his assigned schedule, allow me to take half that minute to unabashedly promote his book. I did so at an Interfaith panel I was privileged to moderate on Friday. This is a, a book that I have definitely indicated to my uh, fellow Muslims that no Muslim library can afford to be without this. And I dare say that many of our Interfaith friends may find it useful too. It's uh, up on Amazon, and a total disclaimer, I get no share of the benefits from the sale of the book, except for the du'as of uh, tomorrow perhaps, but it's a fantastic book and you really should all have it. I'm moving on with our program. The next gentleman I'm going to invite to the stage, he's director of the Secretariat of the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers at their Washington, D.C. office, which is part of the impressive global operations of Finn Church Aid. Dr. Muhammad al Sanusi. He previously served as Director of Community Outreach and Interfaith Relations at ISNA. Born into a Sudanese family, Dr. Sanusi has a bachelor's degree in Sharia and law from Pakistan. Interestingly, he financed his studies there by purchasing Pakistani fabrics and selling them on to Qatar. <laughs> that would have really been tough under the current blockade, Dr. Sanusi. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Sanusi is also the founding co-chair of Shoulder to Shoulder. He serves on the board of directors and advisors at, 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 for numerous interfaith organizations, including the advisory board of the Louis Finkelstein Institute and the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City. A dear personal friend, Mr. Muhammad is rightly promoted by his current employer as, on this website, you can look it up, they say, a rare gem is working for Finn Church Aid in peace work. Welcome this rare gem to the <laughs> uh, Thank you so much, uh, Brother Karim Afran, and uh, I always appreciate uh, your leadership and commitment to interfaith dialogue, cooperation, and collaboration. We have worked together in the past uh, 15 years uh, during my time at ISNA, closely with Karim Erfan to advance our interfaith engagement. Uh, but this afternoon, I want to really welcome all of you and greet you by the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum 
and peace be unto you all. Um, you know, Dr. Morrow actually set the stage very well for me uh, to talk to you about the Marrakesh Declaration, uh, a declaration that is um, adopted in January of 2016, and uh, a declaration that I see as a product of our own American Muslim community's interfaith engagement and, and partnership and collaboration, and the strategic visions uh, for people like Dr. Saeed and ISNA leadership to have that interreligious engagement. And as a product of that interreligious engagement, we see today uh, the people of other faith is standing with American Muslims to uphold American values, whether through shoulder to shoulder that has been mentioned and then now becoming known, or the national campaign against torture that the Muslim played a major role, and we are honored to have the executive director here as well. But these interfaith engagement help us as an American Muslim community when we see our interfaith partners standing with us, now we see there is a duty and obligation on us. Also, we cannot allow any persecution for religious minorities in the Muslim majority communities. That is the premise actually engage and, 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 and help us under the leadership with Imam Majid who was Isna president at the time to talk to the Muslim world and to leaders of the Muslim, Muslim world um, to discuss what we can do, what we can do to bring up the standards and protocol, to bring up the practice of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Medina 1400 years ago. The covenant was just mentioned, but there was a Medina charter as well. That effort, we talked to the Muslim world leadership, to the scholars, and we work closely with them, and we build a road to Marrakesh Declaration a road that began in Mauritania, engaging Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya to host the first of its kind meeting with a small number of scholars with the Minister of Islamic Affairs from North Africa to raise questions about the rights of religious minorities in the Muslim majority communities. Those questions were answered in Tunisia with 50 scholars as well, Imam Majid and I and Dr. Ingrid Matson and others were there were there to discuss and answer those questions. Our engagement on religious freedom at that time in Tunisia, where to, at the time when Tunisia actually went through discussing their own constitutions, we were able to influence the parliament, transitional parliament at that time. Today, the entire globe celebrating uh, Tunisia constitution because it's actually adopted the religious freedom for everyone. But that effort continued until we had the big meeting in Marrakesh. The King of Morocco accepted to host the meeting. We had about 250 Muslim scholars and more than uh, you know, 35 Minister of Education and Islamic Affairs from the OIC countries to come to Marrakesh and came with the Marrakesh declarations. Some of you in this room actually from our own interfaith communities were there to witness to witness the efforts. Uh, Dr. Jim Winkler is here as the head of the National Council of Churches, was in Marrakesh with us. And uh, the picture you see there, these are the interfaith communities attending and meeting with Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya after the adoption of the declaration to discuss one question. That question, we have a declaration, but we cannot afford to not to implement Marrakesh Declaration because declaration tend to be in shelf, but we cannot afford not to implement the Marrakesh Declarations. So then, what happened after that? Including actual interreligious communities attended there, including representatives from the Jewish community. Uh, my good friend, uh, Rabbi David Rosen, was there, who's currently served the co-chair of the AGC, American Jewish Committee, International Interreligious uh, council. So he was there as well, and 50 others as well. But since the declaration was adopted, unrecognized by a number of people, when we were meeting in Marrakesh, President Obama from the White House in that January 25th, 2016, said visiting the Israeli embassy in Washington, making a statement, and in that statement said, as we speak today here in Washington, 
Muslim scholars gathered in Marrakesh to protect the right of religious minorities in the Muslim majority communities. That is a recognition of history. Since, since that, that time, we saw also the United Nations recognize the declaration, the organizations of security cooperation in Europe recognize the declaration, and the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, in the presiden presidential meeting in Istanbul, they added to their declaration clear endorsement to the Marrakesh Declaration. So the implementations move forward after all of this rec recognition. The first meeting we had for implementation was uh, the Prime Minister of Japan. And this is uh, interesting. Uh, actually, he wanted to do an interfaith and interreligious. So he asked religions for, for peace, a number of you are familiar with, to have meeting in Tokyo to discuss Marrakesh Declaration between Sunni scholars and Shia scholars. And we had that meeting just before the G7 summit in May uh, of, of last year. And, 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 uh, and, and the purpose of that actually just to talk about it at that presidential level. So the G7 summit, we did also meetings in Nigeria to engage religious actors on the declaration, as well as uh, we also uh, recently, we have a new initiative built and based on Marrakesh Declaration to engage evangelical pastors and rabbis and imams. Imam Majid and I, we just uh, did that program uh, in, in the UAE and we came back. Next meeting is going to have 20 rabbis, 20 evangelical pastors and 20 imams. The meeting is going to be in Morocco and the other meeting is going to be in, in, in Washington in January 2018 for a, a number of also evangelical pastors and rabbis and imams. And these are evangelical pastors from the Bible Belt area. And the purpose of this engagement is how we can use the Moroccan Declaration, as Dr. Mauro has said, to be as a tool and foundation for interreligious cooperation, enhancing understanding. Last but not the least, in December of this year, the Vatican is hosting us in close collaboration with Tom Farr, the Interreligious the Religious Freedom Institute of your town, to discuss Moroccan Declaration and how we can further it. Well, these are only the highlights that I'm giving you, but the Declaration should remain alive and we are committed to keep it as such. Thank you so much. Having covered the Muslim legacy of productive social engagement, my dear friends, we now move on to the nurturing of faithful partnerships. The next speaker that I would like to invite is the campaign director of Shoulder to Shoulder, a national campaign of religious and interfaith organizations dedicated to ending anti-Muslim bigotry in the United States and around the world. Catherine Orsborn herself actively works on strategies for combating discrimination against the Muslim faith and promoting interfaith engagement and solidarity that focuses on positive relationships across faith lines. She holds a master's in religious studies from the University of Denver and is currently completing her doctorate in religion and social change. Please welcome the soon to be Dr. Orsborn to address us. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here tonight and um, want to thank ISNA for um, inviting us to be here and and for really nurturing and helping to create shoulder to shoulder over the years and, and supporting our work. Um, we are really indebted to ISNA's support over time and um, we're really grateful to be part of this, this community. Um, and want to also thank the number of shoulder to shoulder leaders who are here in the room um, who have served with us in in various capacities. We have a number of those folks in the room tonight, and um, really this is a collective effort that would not exist without the leaders in this room, so thank you. Um, and especially want to thank Dr. Saeed, um, who has been a source of so much work and inspiration that we're hearing about tonight, and um, it's a pleasure to be part of honoring you. Um, so Shoulder to Shoulder was formed in 2010 as a multi-faith response to increasing anti-Muslim sentiment in the US. 
The message at that time as it remains is that an attack on one faith community is an attack on all. Our coalition has grown over the last seven years, starting with 20 national member denominations and organizations, and today we have 35 member institutions at the national level and close to 50 local partners um, working in their own communities across the U.S. in various ways. Our members speak from their own religious teachings and traditions when they say that this sort of fear-mongering rhetoric and discriminatory policy is not reflective of the values of any of our faith traditions. And they also speak as Americans in saying that we all rely upon and therefore must preserve and further the ideals of religious freedom and equality for all people. Um, so our work is both internal and external. Internally, we work with our members to educate and equip their own clergy, lay leaders, and constituencies on this issue and how it connects to other issues we're dealing with in our country. Um, we do this through trainings, resource development, and the like. And externally, we combine our voices and efforts in a variety of ways in the public square to say unequivocally that anti-Muslim discrimination is not okay in whatever form it comes. We work in coalition with our Muslim and allied partners. That's a really important part of the way that we do our work. And over the past few years, we've worked to create nationwide opportunities for encounter, for deep engagement, and learning. We've engaged faith leaders in local challenges against anti-Sharia and anti-refugee legislation, especially over the past couple of years. And we've worked to push back against national discriminatory policies as well. Um, we've seen the power of our network when we've mobilized faith partners in different cities across the U.S. in faithful response to anti-mosque rallies in 2010 and most recently in response to anti-Sharia marches last month. Um, and I want to note that beyond these more public expressions of solidarity, so much of the work on this issue um, within our network and beyond it happens in many quieter ways across the country. Um, through things like letters of support and smaller gestures of outreach that, um, that build over time and that people are able to build on in their own communities and, and in the small ways that don't necessarily make it to the newspaper headlines. Um, so while this year has been full of new realities um, and developments and many um, are, are fear-inducing and alarming to many of us, um, I've been heartened by the number of people that are reaching out to engage in this work. There are so many people across the U.S. who want to find ways to reach out and to stand in solidarity and to together create the country that we want, an America where we're all truly free. So, while there's a lot of work ahead of us, we know that there are many hands and feet to do it, and I think that um, encompasses so many people in this room, and we're grateful to be part of this evening with you. Thank you. that timely, aggressive, any indication of how your thesis is going, you'll be a doctor much sooner than we anticipated. <laughs> my colleagues in the business area and some in the interfaith area know of my passion for driving principled and ethically founded executive excellence in the business world. <coughs> Hence, I'm particularly anxious to hear from our next speaker, a fellow business executive. Mr. Farooq Katwari is the chairman, president, and CEO of Ethan Allen Interiors. Now celebrating 20 years at the helm of Ethan Allen, Mr. Katwari's leadership has transformed his company into a leading manufacturer and retailer of home furnishings in the US since he took the company public in 1993. While I admire his singular achievements in the business world. Hats off to you, Mr. Katwari. I find his services for not-for-profit organizations particularly inspiring, including as chairman of Refugees International, chairman of the Kashmir Study Group, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee of the World Conference of Religions for Peace, a trustee of Freedom House, a director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University, and a member of the Mahatma Gandhi Center for Global Nonviolence and their advisory board. His recognitions include the Outstanding American by Choice Award by the US government, the Epic Global Citizenship Award from Tufts University, 
the Eleanor Roosevelt Val Kill Medal, the International First Freedom Award from the Council for America's First Freedom, and the Anti-Defamation League's Humanitarian Award. Today, Mr. Katwadi will speak about Ethan Allen's recent financials, including prior year comparisons, when sales increased 10% and earnings per share increased 89%, and how Ethan Allen will manage higher discounting while improving gross margins. Does that make sense? No, seriously, that was for his third quarter sales call. Tonight, Mr. Katwadi will cover important developments in promoting Muslim-Jewish relationships in the United States as part of the Jewish Muslim Advisory Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a CEO I admire tremendously and a great leader for the social cause, Mr. Farouk Kepa. Well, thank you very much for that long uh, introduction. <laughs> And in the name of God, most gracious and most merciful, peace be upon you. It is my great pleasure to be with you today and discuss a very important initiative. When I go back 10 years, and I spent a fair amount of time in Chicago, co-chairing a task force with Lynn Martin, a former United States Secretary of Labor, the initiative was sponsored by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs with many leaders from this region and other parts of the country. The subject was strengthening America, the civic and political integration of Muslim Americans. Ten years later, the challenges remain, and in that context, thanks to the leadership of President Aziz Azhar, and the National Director, Dr. Said Said, David Harris, CEO of, and CEO, and Robert Silverman, U.S. Director of Muslim Jewish Relations of the American Jewish Committee. A new partnership has been developed that will benefit both the American Muslim and the American Jewish communities and the entire country. While not an easy decision to join a very public undertaking, while heading a well-known public company, doing business all over the country. I decided to join and help in shaping the debate as I see concern among many, but especially the young ones who are born and raised here and who strongly believe in strengthening America. I came to the US as a young student from the beautiful mountains of Kashmir to beautiful Brooklyn. <laughs> and discovered that America is a welcoming country where hard work and a little luck can help a person go far. This still holds, holds true. Last month, I had the opportunity to be one of the main speakers at the annual convention of the American Jewish Committee in Washington, D.C., where about 2,500 delegates attended from all over the world and the launch of the American Muslim Jewish Advisory Council was discussed and warmly received. But I have mentioned it over there that perhaps one of the reasons I was selected is because, and Dr. Said and one of, one of a few others will know this, that in the native language of Kashmir, the, the land is called Kashir, and the person coming from Kashir and the language of Kashir is called kosher, so I told him I'm more kosher than any of you. <laughs> and I'm proud to serve as co-chair of this new partnership, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, together with Stanley Bergman. We are both immigrants, as I said, to this country and CEOs of well-known public companies who have enjoyed the opportunities this great country provides. <laughs> The Muslim Jewish Advisory Council is a diverse group of 42 American Muslims and Jews who are business, religious, political, and civil society leaders from all over the country. We have served several leaders from Chicago in the group, Talat Ottman, Ibu Patel, and Tahira Ahmed. We are a bipartisan group. To me, that was very important. We have former Senator Joe Lieberman, an independent, former Congressman Steve Israel, a Democrat, 
as well as former Senator Norm Coleman, a Republican. Because we are bipartisan, we are able to make progress on one of the major issues facing our communities and our country, the rise of hate crime directed at Americans because of their religion. FBI statistics show that the largest single target of hate crimes by religion in this country are Jews. And the fastest rising number of hate crimes by religion are targeting Muslims. We know this anecdotally, that the five mosques that have suffered arson attacks in the last six months, the three Jewish cemeteries that have been vandalized and synagogues defaced with graffiti of swastikas. Our second initiative is to project the contributions to society made by Americans who are Muslims and Jews. This is important, otherwise the debate will continue to be shaped with people with loud voices and a divisive agenda. In this regard, we plan to launch a public relations campaign. The Council is working with both Republicans and Democrats to pass a bill called the Protecting Religiously Affiliated Institutions Act of 2017 which will expand the federal protections for houses of worship and deepen the penalties for hate crimes against our institutions. <coughs> if you would like more information on how to help us advocate for passing this bill, please see the Council's Director, Bob Sulman, who is here tonight. <coughs> Bob, how about uh, raising your hand? <laughs> entering this partnership was not easy for many of us, but the right thing to do for our communities, our country, and our children. And now just a brief about Dr. Say. Now Dr. Say and I go long, for a long, long, many years. In fact, he just told me that he was a professor in a college. I was in, in Kashmir, but he said you were never there because you're always playing cricket. <laughs> <laughs> we also served for many years on this organization religions for peace and together went to many many places it really has been a great privilege first to know you for so many years and the one and your service to the community and the country and i'm very pleased and honored to be here with you today this evening thank you dr Prof. dr Kapari. <laughs> I got some three honorary. I know. That's precisely why I'm, I'm using that. And I can understand you're finishing on time because those sales calls I've participated in those, you, you can barely wait to get away from the analysts, so I appreciate that, that, that shortness. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to a, an important segment. Uh, 2017, as uh, almost all of you will re recall, marks 500 years since a profound thinker. Martin Luther published his 95 Theses and launched the Protestant Reformation, a momentous religious revolution which changed the history of the church, the country, and the world forever. And part of those changes we are experiencing firsthand under the insightful leadership from thoughtful leaders like our own Dr. Saeed and the presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. ISNA has forged a visionary collaboration with the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which continues to yield a remarkable progress in relationships and initiatives. I will request my ELCA associate, Catherine Lowry, to lead us through this segment. She is the executive for ecumenical and interreligious relations and assistant to the presiding bishop at the ELCA. Ms. Lowry has a Master's of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School and previously served as president of the National Council of Churches the first Lutheran and the youngest woman at the time to serve in the position. Into my fourth decade of privileged interfaith work around the globe, I was thrilled to hear, Catherine, your commitment to support the ELCA, as you yourself put it best, expanding our interreligious relationships through new and renewed bilateral relationships, dialogues, and multilateral initiatives. In inviting Catherine to the podium, I will highlight your assessment of her unique strengths, President Bishop Eaton, when you said she's known across this church and amongst our ecumenical and interreligious colleagues for her keen theological insight, gracious collegiality, and integrity. Please welcome Catherine Lord.
Good evening. Good evening. It is such a joy to be here. We've anticipated this weekend and this evening for so long, and I want to thank you, our partners at ISNA and all of our interreligious partners present tonight, uh, for engaging with us as we recommit to Lutheran-Muslim relations tonight. A year ago, um, as we were approaching the eve of this 500th anniversary, Dr. Saeed approached us with a really visionary proposal. And any of you who have been on the receiving end of that know just how enormous those proposals can be. And so we received that with joy, and we thought, what, what is it that we can do on this 500th anniversary year that would lift up a long-standing commitment that we have to Lutheran-Muslim partnerships and pivot toward what we as Lutherans have been calling the ongoing reformation? So as we look to the next 500 years, but really to the, the immediate um, concerns in our society, this is a central relationship for us, and we hope that we can share a bit of that with you tonight. Part of that proposal was the suggestion of finding ways to continue to engage, but especially on the ground in local communities, through church mosque partnerships and other forms of local dialogue and engagement. And we were excited about that, not only because we already had several things happening that we thought we could build upon, but we could see where some of the gaps were. And the first question that we asked of Dr. Saeed was, why just us as Lutherans? Why not do this broader? And he said, I, very clearly, you have the leaders who, are, who have the will to lead, you have the dialogue and engagement resources already prepared, many of those scholars and activists who've prepared them are present with us tonight, and you are ready to go. And then we can pivot out from there. So tonight, what I want to do is invite three of our bishops representing three of our synods, um, West Coast, East Coast, and then we'll come back here to Chicago to share with you a bit of what is happening. First, I'll call upon Bishop Rick Jake. He's representing the Southwestern Washington Synod in the Pacific Northwest. First, I would like to say thank you for uh, welcoming me to this ISNA convention. It's been a delight for me. It's been a time of great learning and a time of deepening a relationship. So you have given me a real gift just in being here. So I thank you for that and thank you for all the important work that you are doing. I am the bishop out in Washington State. I'm one of three bishops out there. Uh, out on the, on the city coast, my office is just below Seattle, Washington. And one of the things that we did just this last year to build upon our interfaith, interreligious cooperation is that uh, Lutherans and Episcopalians and the Islamic centers of Washington State have combined to create a program that we call Neighbors in Faith. Uh, we have supported this financially. We have uh, all put in uh, financial resources to hire a person uh, to carry out the ministry of bringing neighbors in faith together. And so, for example, the Islamic Center of Puget Sound, which is located in Redmond, Washington, which is where the headquarters for Microsoft are, it's just a little bit east of Seattle. And one of the leaders there, Anila Afsali, has been very engaged with us in um, the hiring of Pastor Terry Kylo to help foster neighbors in faith. And it, it, we, are, we have three objectives. First, we want to link together uh, local congregations and local Islamic centers to really know and work with each other. So for example, in the city of Vancouver, Washington, which is right down by Portland, Oregon, uh, the Islamic Center of Southwestern Washington, and it's one of its key leaders, Dr. Khalid Khan, who is a professor at the University of Portland, they have linked up with Lutheran congregations, for example, Beautiful, La uh, Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church, so that people can uh, know each other, can dialogue, they do community projects together, they work with one another to improve their, their civic uh, atmosphere. And so the first objective of Neighbors in Faith is simply at a grassroots level to help congregations and Islamic centers know each other and work together. Uh, the second objective is at a broader educational level that we organize uh, public forums. We have done 20 of these in this last year where members of local Islamic centers come to be our teachers, to be our educators about 
faith, about culture, about political background. And then we gather as many uh, Lutherans and Episcopalians as we can. And in most cases, for a lot of our Lutherans and, and Episcopalian folk, this is the first time, literally the first time, that they have met a Muslim person and really hear the positive values and the positive uh, desire for being patriotic Americans and being people of faith. In those, uh, so far this year, those 20 gatherings have gathered together 4,500 people who have been able to go through this educational experience together. Third, the third objective, and we do this closely in cooperation with Shoulder to Shoulder, is that we are setting up training workshops, um, specific training workshops where members of our churches are trained so that if they see uh, someone being abused, someone being insulted, particularly they look for Muslim and Jewish people, if there's any forms of abuse, they are trained how to intervene on the spot how to put themselves active in protection, how to take the report to the authorities, how to be advocates. So we want to be uh, real uh, allies, real helpers in this. And so again, we appreciate so much working with Shoulder to Shoulder. So there are, in the state of Washington, there are about 500 Lutheran churches, 500 pastors with 100,000 members. I promise to you, we are your friends. We are your allies. We are neighbors in faith, and we do this together to the glory of God. Thank you very much. We'll now take a quick flight across to Philadelphia, where we'll welcome Bishop Claire Burkett of our Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod and Imam Anwar Muhammad. They are together the co-chairs of the Religious Leaders Council of Greater Philadelphia. Salam alaikum. Um, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod is the metropolitan Philadelphia area. And I'm here, I'm very proud to be here with my colleague and my friend and my co-convener, Anwar Mohamed. And we also serve as co-conveners with Rabbi David Strauss and Archbishop Charles Chaput of uh, the Archdiocese of, um, of Philadelphia. Allow me, before we begin, to share a word uh, from the Bible, from the Old Testament, very dear prophet uh, for the Jewish faith and for the Christian faith from the prophet Micah. This uh, passage has informed my faith in my life and my action in this regard. Micah 6, verse 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shara'a lakum min al-deen ma wassa bihi nuhan wal-ladhi awhayna ilayk. وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيم الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه. As my colleague mentioned, I'm Anwar Mohamed, and I'm here with my dear friend Claire Burkett, representing the Religious Leaders Council of Greater Philadelphia and uh, the wonderful city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. And the verse, it is for real. <laughs> it really is. Um, the verse that informs my work is what I just recited a part of, and it reads, in matters of faith, he has endured, ordained for you that which he has enjoined upon Noah, and into which he gave thee, O Muhammad, insight through revelation, as well as that which he has enjoined upon Abraham and Moses and Jesus, Steadfastly uphold the true faith and do not break up your unity therein. <laughs> All right, there's a little formal, right? Claire and I rehearsed this. <laughs> so it's my turn. We even had those signals. So I want to talk to you this evening about. Um, a few things. Claire and I have really been blessed to do wonderful work, and I say to people all the time, as our as our friendship has grown, 
And I have to tell people I'm here as a Muslim man. I'm the son of people who converted to Islam in the mid-50s. I was raised in Islam. Um, but this, e this weekend, I'm here as an honorary Lutheran. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know too many Imams that can say that, right? But I'm proud to say that. And so I want to speak about an experience and tell you a very, very brief story of a recent experience that Claire and I have uh, shared because our friendship has grown over time. And so in October of 2016, I received an invitation from Claire uh, to uh, speak at the Bishop's Convocation. And really, this was a tremendous honor for me. It was certainly a first for me. And uh, when I thought about it, it gave me some thoughts about really her, uh, some, her insight and her foresight and her courage as a leader. Because this is really level five leadership stuff. This is what the, the literature says about this. It's level five leadership stuff. And so I was invited to speak to leaders who were currently serving, as well as emerging leaders. And we spoke about things that later on materialized because this was a pre-election mm -hmm. event. And we were talking about shared concerns, about how we perceive the climate of the country to be changing and to be shifting. And so to be invited to this convocation and to speak in front of clergy people who are not of my faith tradition and to be welcomed and embraced was truly a tremendous experience that I will cherish for many, many years to come. And um, I, as I mentioned, it's an example of the work that we've been blessed to do together, uh, Claire and I. So the name of the conference was Crossing Bridges, Interfaith Relationships in a Pluralistic World. So the day after the election, I called uh, Anwar and I called Rabbi David Strauss to offer my support and to assure them of our continuing support and protection from the Lutheran Church. In that conversation, the three of us lamented that our clergy were very distressed uh, following the election and during the election season about the increasingly nasty political rhetoric and the divisions that we're, we were facing in all of our congregations. And our leaders, many of them are very young. This is the first time they ever had to deal with this kind of um, hate-filled divisions even in their own congregations. So together we planned an interfaith conference at the Lutheran Seminary in Philadelphia to support all of our clergy and to provide a safe and confidential platform for mutual support. So you can imagine our surprise when 180 clergy, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, signed up for this event. <laughs> I'm a little slow, right? So, <laughs> but so the event that Claire is speaking about, actually one of the highlights as well, is that in addition to the abundance of attendees, 180 people, um, additionally this event followed, uh, first in the year 2015, there was the desecration of one of our uh, mosques in Philadelphia. Someone cut off a pig head, and delivered it to the mosque and left it on the doorstep. And we were very uh, quickly able to mobilize a group of people who stood in solidarity and in rejection of this gesture of disrespect and hate. And then the night before the um, uh, conference, there was uh, the desecration that took place in the Jewish cemetery. So I believe around 300 headstones were broken and the cemetery was really destroyed. And again, we were able to stand together and we called because of the pre-existing work that took place to form relationships, we called a press conference. And this is the, the picture that you see of us together at the conference. There's Claire at the top of the screen. And there's me at the bottom of the screen. And on to your left are the leaders who gathered that day. And we all stood and it was a very powerful moment because we stood as brothers and sisters in humanity and in the fraternity of our respective religions. 
So I believe that God was pleased with our efforts to protect and defend one another. And so when we are trying to do justice, to promote kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, we are blessed beyond our, our even imagining. God multiplied our intentions a thousandfold with 180 faith leaders and the television crews, the Our Witness uh, served to meet the metropolitan Philadelphia area for more than 4 million viewers. And we both were hearing uh, from all sorts of circles how proud they were that interfaith leaders were there and standing so fast the day after the desecration of the cemetery. So in closing, when people of faith start with what is right, with what is true, with what is courageous, with what is just, and what promotes peace, then we can watch how God takes our work and our love and our respect for one another and multiplies it in ways and means we cannot ever fully understand or imagine. And in closing as well, I'd like to just leave us with some parting words from one of my spiritual predecessors, uh, Imam Martin Di Muhammad, I mean, a lot of mercy on the soul, who really spoke some words that should serve as an encouragement to us all to continue the work that we're all doing in our respective areas. Geographically, we're all doing work that must be done. And the forging of relationships and the crossing of the bridges is a work of continuation. And so I leave you with the words of Imam Martha bin Muhammad who said um, that we are all one creation and our belief in the one creator unites us in spite of artificial divisions of race, color, and natural, natural origin. We are united by the most powerful bond of all, our common human origin. The real issues that concern us and affect our social and economic destiny and the destiny of our children's children are vital to, to all end and are more profound than any ideological differences that we may have. Our enemy is not the free world or the communist world, nor Christianity, Judaism, or any other religion. Our enemy is ignorance, racism, oppression, greed, and corruption. And I call to you in the name of the Almighty to unite and to continue to, not to unite and to continue to come together. And may all Allah Almighty accept from us. Amen. All right. And now we will come back to Chicago. Last but not least, Bishop Wayne Miller of the Metropolitan Chicago Synod. Alamalaika. Good evening. Very nice to be with you again tonight. This is my second time here at the ISNA convention, and it's good to be back with you. Actually, I come before you tonight in two roles at the same time, because in addition to being here as the Bishop of the Metropolitan Chicago Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, I'm also presently serving as President of the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. Many of those leaders are here with us this evening. Kareem Irfan is a former president of our organization, and um, it's important for me to mention that to you because I think that uh, Lutheran Muslim engagement on the territory of this Senate in northeastern Illinois really is happening simultaneously uh, in four areas of endeavor that are separate and yet interrelated. And the first of those has to do with the Council of Religious Leaders here. This is a very important group. It's a, it's a coalition, a fellowship, really, of some 40 leaders from 40 different religious organizations that meet regularly to foster friendship and cooperation, respect and mutual understanding, and also to engage in uh, activities that forward the uh, well-being of the entire metropolitan Chicago area. The second area, this is a, a resource that is very distinctive to our territory, and that is the Center for Christian Muslim Engagement, which is housed at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Many of uh, the folks and leaders from the center are here as well. The third area, of course, as we've already heard something about, is local grassroots activity from congregation to mosque in local areas and the ways that activity is going on there. And the fourth area of engagement has to do with advocacy and public policy uh, action. 
All of these things are important to one another. They all lean on one another. The work of the Council of Religious Leaders is now very actively opening up possibilities for grassroots activity in our congregations almost weekly now. I hear from one of our pastors describing a new endeavor that they're making to reach out and form relationships with local mosques and also other interfaith partnerships. It's also very important and very enriching for us to have the Center for Christian Muslim Engagement here, which adds a level of theological reflection and also cultural exchange that might not otherwise be available to us. And of course, that grassroots work is very encouraging to me as I see people reaching out beyond those boundaries. And not least of all, as we've already heard something about, this whole area of public policy engagement which is so terribly important to us now. And here in Chicago, we have a combination of a long-standing community organizing groups that have been mobilized now in the spirit of our times, but also ad hoc groups, new groups that are rising up, opportunities to engage in public actions, which is so terribly important to all of the rest of this. Because we, when we engage in these public actions, we make a bold and unequivocal witness that public policy and public speech that encourages hatred, that encourages misunderstanding, that breeds violence and contempt for one another, that that rhetoric and that policy has no place in our religious communities, any of them, and has no place in this society that we share. We believe that it's by investing in all four of these areas that we live toward the hope of a better day. Thank you. Thank you to our bishops and Bishop Imam. We'll claim you. <laughs> um, just a few words in closing. Um, we have 65 synods as the ELCA. In the remaining 62, I suspect we could hear countless stories from, from all of those other places. And there are people here tonight from the local area and the Northern Illinois Synod who also have stories. So we hope that this has been an encouragement with you. I want to share an invitation also. We need you in order to continue this partnership. We need you, if you're Muslim, to go to your local Lutheran neighbors and say, could we do something? Could we engage in dialogue? Could we engage in, in uh, collaboration for our community? And to do that, I want to just point you to some of the resources on your table. This uh, Lutheran Contemporary Interreligious Relations was produced by the Consultative Panel on Lutheran Jewish Relations, but it also has a broader frame for interreligious relations as well. You also have copies of Talking Points. Um, topics in Christian Muslim relations. These are also downloadable from our ELCA.org website. And then finally, there's a new book of case studies um, uh, edited and uh, by Carol Shurston Laverde, who's here with us, and many of the contributors uh, to that volume are also in this room. It's called Engaging Others, Knowing Ourselves, a Lutheran Witness in a Multi-Religious World. Dr. Saeed actually was one of our interreligious reviewers. And um, that, those case studies we would encourage uh, for conversation, reflection, and dialogue. We have some copies of the book available tonight. If you would like one, please see Carol. She's back there. Um, or you can also find them on Amazon.com. Finally, Dr. Said, we have caught the vision. We have caught your vision. We are, we are on this journey together. Today's Washington Post front page story features Lutheran-Muslim relations. One of our pastor, our intern pastors in Boston, Minnesota, realized that her physician was, and his family were the only Muslims in this very small town in Minnesota. She reached out to him and said, would you be willing to lead a town hall conversation to share about Islam and to have some dialogue? This was a very difficult decision for him and his family, and you can read all about it here, and I would encourage us by this. And also, on July 13th, um, one of our Lutheran pastors in, Phila uh, in Pennsylvania, in Wexford, Fred Schenker, who um, partnered with 
local Muslims uh, there as, as they were seeking to build their mosque and they needed a place for the Ummah to, um, to pray. And they opened up their doors at Trinity in Wexford. That will be featured in the USA Today on July 13th. So we're hoping to share these stories. We're in, uh, inviting you who are interreligious partners to help us share these stories. And Dr. Saeed, finally, a, a moment of just personal privilege. I studied you as a graduate student. To have these years to work side by side with you through shoulder to shoulder during my presidency of the National Council of Churches and now with the ELCA is the privilege of a lifetime. And we will continue this work together and to honor your legacy. Thank you. Folks, I, I wish I had an Alec Baldwin impersonation, but if I did, I would say this is not fake news. <laughs> we move on to the exciting conclusion of tonight, the presentation of ISNA's Distinguished Interfaith Leadership Awards. Our first recipient is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America's presiding bishop, Dr. Elizabeth A. Eaton. Reverend Eaton serves as the fourth presiding bishop and the first woman to become presiding bishop. The ELCA is one of the largest Christian denominations in the U.S. with approximately four million members in nearly 10,000 congregations across the U.S. Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. She also serves as the Vice President of the North American region of the Lutheran World Federation, a global communion of 145 Lutheran churches representing over 74 million Christians in 98 countries. Based on my personal experience, especially with such wonderful leaders like my dear friend Reverend Bishop uh, Wayne Miller. Uh, the time that I had the two years to serve as the president of the Council of Religious Leaders, they were much more effective than I could possibly have been if it, uh, if it were not for the privileged participation of my dear friend Bishop Miller. Thank you so much for that. But I can personally vouch on that basis and other engagements as to how the ELCA has a commendable commitment to working across Americas and the world's diversity of faiths and denominations and with interreligious partners to build bridges of mutual understanding, justice and peace in the US and globally. For the past four years, this ELCA direction has been furthered phenomenally by Bishop Eaton as the chief ecumenical and interreligious officer of the church. ISNA particularly appreciates how Bishop Eaton has given significant leadership to Lutheran-Muslim relationships within the ELCA through the LWF with Muslim partners and through interfaith coalitions such as the Shoulder to Shoulder campaign. In 2014, Bishop Eaton attended the ISNA convention in Detroit. She engaged personally with Muslim partners. She also educated the ELCA about Muslims and it, on its long-standing partnership with ISNA and the church's commitments to addressing anti-Muslim bias. We appreciate that. In 2015, following the tragic violence in San Bernardino, Bishop Eaton boldly issued an open letter to the American Muslim community, writing, in our love for you, our Muslim neighbors, we are distressed by the ways in which you are being forced to bear the fears held by many in our nation. Therefore, she went on to say, we renew our commitment to find even more effective ways to protect and defend you from words and actions that assault your safety and well-being. In 2016, she welcomed Dr. Sayyid Saeed to the ELCA churchwide assembly at which he called for deeper partnership as Christians and Muslims. And the assembly responded by adopting a resolution titled, My Muslim Neighbor. For folks outside the Lutheran community, just imagine the tremendous impact and import of that. 
This is the resolution adopted by the ELCA Churchwide Assembly with recommendations to commend the ELCA Educational Resources on Christian-Muslim Relations for use across this church to encourage ELCA members to commit themselves to opposing, preventing, and eliminating Islamophobia, and to encourage ELCA leaders to engage in dialogue, friendship, and cooperative efforts with Muslim neighbors whenever possible. That's a profoundly impactful statement, and it bears our applause on your behalf, Dr. <laughs> Bishop Eaton has since been ex exhibiting fine leadership by leading this important mandate. In partnership with Dr. Saeed, she has invited the leadership of ELCA Senate Bishops for church mosque pilot projects, building upon local and regional initiatives across the church. She has appointed an interreligious task force to develop an interreligious policy statement for the church, which will guide partnerships with Muslims and other neighbors into the future. This year, in 2017, the global commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Bishop Eaton has been elected to serve as the Vice President we are, of the North American region of the Lutheran World Federation. In this capacity, she will be a forceful ambassador for and interpreter of the LWF's significant leadership in Lutheran Muslim relations on a global scale. Tonight, my dear friends, we recognize a lifetime of leading by action in furtherance of interreligious understanding and building bridges of mutual understanding, justice, and peace by conferring ISNA's Interfaith Leadership Award upon the Bishop Elizabeth A. Eaton. Kindly join me in welcoming Bishop Eaton with a round of applause. And we, we have a commemorative video that will highlight your efforts as we welcome Bishop Eaton. You have been the fourth presiding bishop at the 2013 Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's Churchwide Assembly. The Reverend Elizabeth Eaton earned a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School and a Bachelor of Music Education from the College of Worcester. Ordained in 1981, Reverend Eaton served three different congregations in Ohio as assistant pastor, interim pastor, and pastor before being elected bishop of the ELCA Northeastern Ohio Synod in 2006 and re-elected in May 2013. Reverend Eaton also represents the ELCA in a wide range of ecumenical and interfaith settings. She serves on the National Council of the Churches of Christ and the USA Governing Board and Development Committee, Religions for Peace USA Council of Presidents, and Lutheran World Federation Council. Eaton's presence witnesses the commitments of the ELCA to its long-term ecumenical partners, both in conciliar and bilateral settings. Reverend Eaton has actively taken up a commitment to addressing anti-Muslim bigotry. In 2014, at the ISNA convention in Detroit, she brought greetings. Her participation at the convention provided opportunities for educating her church's own membership and addressing anti-Muslim bias. Her leadership encourages other ELCA leaders to step up in their efforts against anti-Muslim bigotry. We are beginning to see a ripple effect. Dr. Saeed has greeted ELCA's assembly and encouraged a deeper partnership. The assembly adopted a resolution on My Muslim Neighbor with the following recommendations. To commend the ELCA educational resources on Christian Muslim relations for use across this church. To encourage ELCA members to commit themselves to opposing, preventing, and eliminating Islamophobia. And to encourage ELCA leaders to engage in dialogue, friendship, and cooperative efforts with Muslim neighbors whenever possible. This is now a mandate of ELCA, which will be critical as we seek to deepen and expand efforts like this. Join us in congratulating Reverend Elizabeth Eaton for her excellence in interfaith work. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite the ISNA president, Barat Aziz, to hand over the award and 
one towering personality deserves another towering personality, so we do have Dr. Saeed to read out what's on the award too. So if you could present it, and Dr. Saeed, if you, if you could read it out. And we have joining us on stage also Dr. Shakir Moedaldeen, who's the past uh, chairman of the Interfaith Committee of the Council, and this marks 25 years of his work, and he says he's retiring, but we won't let him go away. <laughs> This is a verse from the Quran itself. The verse that has inspired me in this lifelong career to find people who fit that description that Quran has given us. Quranic verse, it tells us, Quran, Surah 3, 13 and 15 verses, it assures Muslims that among the Christians, you will find faithful leaders who are in the forefront of advancing mutual respect, peace, and justice. You are a, we are grateful to the Almighty for blessing us to discover these extraordinary attributes in Reverend Elizabeth Eaton and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America that she leaves with a passion for building bridges of understanding in the US and abroad. These virtues identify her as a leader we are proud to recognize.